Hello everyone, and welcome to a new episode of Gaming in the Wild, a video games podcast about games from the artistic, creative side of the tracks, from indie to AAA. My name's John, and I'm your host, and this week, um, rather than recording in uh, deep snow of Reykjavik and the stormy season, I'm recording in the fairly warm English countryside, still kind of green. Um, I'm back here visiting family for the holidays. So we've had lots of time to catch up, to watch a bit of Andor, to uh, sit reading the newspapers and going for walks, and of course lots of time for playing games as well. I brought back my Switch, I brought back my Series S, I just threw it in the case, seeing as it's so small. And so I've been playing a little bit of Pokemon Arceus, my first ever Pokemon game, having a lot of fun with that. I've been playing a little round of High on Life here and there, I've been dipping back into Kirby and the Forgotten Land, and I've been playing a few indie games as well. It's a nice time of the year for some downtime and some relaxing, and I've been really enjoying this time so far. Um, And I have a special episode for you this week. It is the first guest episode of this Games of the Year season, and it's a a really good guest that I'm really glad to have had on the show. It's Brian Skirscher of the Pixelated Playgrounds podcast podcast. It's a monthly podcast that does a really nice, spoiler-packed, juicy deep dive into a game each month. I've been listening to it for quite a while. I've listened to almost every episode, and so it was really fun to have Brian on the show and to talk about his games of the year, and it's a really nice, juicy list. Um, Our lists, mine's still in progress, it's still coming together, but our lists do share a lot of games, Um, and it was really fun to talk to Brian about those games. And We did talk for an hour and a half, and seeing as it is a nice long conversation. I'm going to keep this intro short and get straight into it. So I hope that you enjoy this Games of the Year episode with Brian Skirscher of Pixelated Playgrounds. Well, I am very happy to be joined this week for the first of our Games of the Year episodes with guests by Brian Skirscher of Pixelated Playgrounds. So hello, Brian. Thank you very much for making time and for being on the show. Yeah, thank you, John. It's it's great to finally talk to you. Yeah, we were just saying before we started recording, that I mean, I listen to Pixelated Playgrounds. I listen to almost every episode. It's a great podcast. Um, if I haven't played the game, I will sometimes put a pin in it until I have. Um, but it's one of my favorite um, video game podcast, a monthly kind of in-depth review podcast. And I was wondering maybe if you could uh, just start by telling us a little bit about that podcast, how it came about and what it is you do over there. Yeah, absolutely. So um, yeah, to your point, uh, I think it's wise to wait until maybe after you've played a game, given where we consider ourselves sort of a video game book club um, and we go full spoilers. So, you know, we we really talk about the game in depth from beginning to end, talking about mechanics, uh, narrative, and uh, the interplay between all those various parts of the game. Um, it was actually originally started by uh, my buddy Josh and I just talking about games over beers, uh, you know, after work, things like that. And later Clint joined as well. And uh, we decided to just see how that would be if we started recording those things and putting them out for the world to hear. And over time, it got a bit more defined. And, and that's where you get pixelated playgrounds, I guess. Yeah, right. So um, I guess you must have known Josh before then. Did you meet through games or if you just have the shared interest? You both have that shared interest? Yeah, so I've known Josh my entire life. Uh, we went to kindergarten together and, uh, you know, it's one of those miracle things where you actually keep in touch with the people you grew up with. Um, harder and harder to do. But um, yeah, and then Clint, I met just after college and we've been good friends ever since. And, uh, you know, we realized we all three shared this common interest. You know, Josh is sort of a hobbyist game developer. Clint and I is just uh, big into games in general. 
Um, but yeah, that's, uh, I think the interesting thing about it is we all do have fairly different tastes when it comes to games. So uh, one, you know, finding ones that we, we want to play or a couple of us want to play uh, is always a, a fun sort of discovery process. Yeah, and you guys have very good chemistry, I think. You know, um, I often find that uh, games media can be super sort of energy drink fueled high tempo <laughs> quite kind of boisterous and you guys yeah. have quite a, ju- a gentle and mild tone to your conversations that i really enjoy so i was really happy to find the show and uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of it well that means a lot you know obviously we you know i i, I in particular really enjoy um, gaming in the wild as well I, I feel like it's such a, a nice way to keep up with what's happening in the indie game scene and hear you know a thoughtful perspective on each of them and you know i, I think that's kind of what we try and bring as well a thoughtful perspective on on the games that we're playing and you know at the end of the day um uh, at its core is still just a few guys talking over drinks about a game or two per month <laughs> mm-hmm Right, and you cover all kinds of games, don't you? I mean, it's from from games that I've never heard of. I found a couple through the podcast, um, through to oh, the, yeah. the big, the biggest releases. Like um, the last episode that you did was on The Last of Us. So you really do run the gamut of uh, of different types of games there. I was going to say, yeah, I'd, I'd love to tell you there's some rhyme or reason behind it, um, but but really it's just what is either interesting us or uh, what catches the eye of someone in the group, and, and you know they drive the decision that hey, you know maybe I'll come along for the ride and, and play that game along with you, and then we'll have a discussion on it. Um, mm-hmm. It's very rare that we like will uh, see a game that's like coming out in the future and be like, well, that's definitely going to be an episode. Um, it's mm-hmm. it's sort of more serendipitous, you know. We're we're pretty. Um, freewheeling in terms of how we choose what games we cover mm-hmm. right and if you've known josh for that long then what games do you remember from the the times when you two were both starting to play like what what is your your gamer history oh yeah well um yeah we uh i guess a lot of uh what you're playing together coming up in, in like grade school and, and things of that nature are your classic multiplayer games so i remember playing a lot of super smash brothers uh josh at sleepovers with friends um things like that and then um he was the one who initially got me into uh, some of the more computer rpg side of things as well so i remember him introducing me to like diablo 2 back in the day yeah i, I remember he was also uh, more into the um, MMO scene back then so I, I he was sort of my gaming Sherpa for a few different uh, um, <laughs> genres uh, as it might be and then you know from there we we both continued to sort of refine our tastes and get a lot more into indies and I think what initially made us want to do a video game book club with or without recording mind you is the game Undertale that was sort of the the origin story of, of me and Josh being like you know there's a lot there's something to these video game things you know <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Right, and I remember, I think I remember listening to one episode where you guys were chatting about how the show began. Maybe it was like an anniversary episode or something. Um, and you mentioned that you had recorded like a test episode on Pyre that never saw the light yeah. of day. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, so we, uh, oddly enough, like as a, as a group, the three of us, me, Clint, and Josh, um, we did the video game book club as just sort of a non-recorded thing for... Uh, about a year, year and a half, just talking about games on Skype, you know, a, a night a month or, or two. And but yeah, Pyre was one of uh, was one of the first ones that we decided, hey, why don't we try um, recording this? And we didn't know what the heck we were doing. Um, you know, none of us are trained in uh, <laughs> uh, audio uh, editing or any of that nature. Um, I kind of just picked it up as we went along. But um, yeah, Pyre was one of the the casualties of those early attempts. <laughs> and maybe <laughs> we'll revisit it someday. It's been so long now. Yeah, that's what I thought when I heard you say that. I was like, "Oh man, I would love to hear, I would love to hear you three talking about Pyre or or you and Josh." Because uh, as a big Super Giant fan, I think it has such an unfairly kind of black sheep of the Super Giant clan reputation, and it's such a lovely game. I totally agree with you there. Um, I I really like pretty much I like every game that Super Giants put out. And the Hades two announcement that we just heard has me all kinds of excited for um, that in in the twenty or in the the coming. I guess it's 2023, right? Um, I don't think they put a date out. They yeah, said it was going to uh, be early access, didn't they? But yeah. Mm, yeah. Well, either way, I'm super excited about that. And, and yeah, I agree with you. Pyre, I don't know why it is that it kind of just fell by the wayside. Like, I don't see it in a different light than I see, say, something like Bandsister, or sorry, Bandsister, uh, Bastion or Transistor. Um, but it, it does <laughs> kind of seem to get forgotten. And it's so unique. I, I really liked it. Me too. You know, I think 
controversially, Pyre is maybe my favorite of the Supergiant games. And it's funny that it's, hmm. it is kind of a little out of step with their others in that the others are all more action oriented, perhaps you could say. Um, and Pyre has obviously got those visual novel elements and it's heavily hmm. story driven and all of that sort of thing. It's, it's a, it's a, such a strange game and such a, I think that's the reason I like it. I just, I hope that Supergiant keep their weird, you know. Uh, yeah, totally agree with you there. And I think the thing that Pyre did, I would say maybe better than any of the other ones in their catalog, is it really let them flex sort of the absurd aspects of their art style. You know, they have such a distinct look, thanks to their um, their lead uh, graphic artist, whose name I'm forgetting at the moment, but I believe she, she is super talented. And mm -hmm. Pyre, I think, is the place where that's most on display. Absolutely. Yeah, and um, I don't know about you, but like when it I think the first really good game that I play each year, and it, it will come at a different time. Sometimes it will be a you know a February, sometimes it will be a July. But there's always a moment in the year when I open up a file, and it's the first name that goes onto my list for my for my games of the year list. And I'm like, finally, it's here. It's the first name is down. Um, and I was wondering, like yeah. you yourself, if you if you have anything similar, do you kind of throughout the year, do you? Do you have that in mind, um, like what your games mm. of the year list might be? Are you, are you that kind of gamer that that makes that list? I am uh, always overly analytical and um, over overly documenting things. So I just, uh, after a while, you know, once things started being not only in Steam, but also on Switch and also on PlayStation, et cetera, et cetera, I just started a like a big old uh, Google Doc uh, spreadsheet with all the games that I want to play and then do play. And so over the course of the year, yeah, I'm, I'm marking down which ones I played and, and really liked. And so it's a little easier to, to go back at that point. Sorry, that's my dog. No um, worries. It's easy at, at that point. <laughs> it's easy at that point to go back and sort of determine, as you said, what's what really kicked off the year in terms of what my favorites are. So yeah, I definitely, uh, when going back and, and thinking about the year, it was uh, it was very apparent to me like what what was coming onto that list right away. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I think most of the games that I have on my my top list are from the first half of the year, weirdly enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've got 10 games here that you've uh, noted down as your your 10 games that we will talk about for uh, your personal games of the year. It's split into three here. We've got a couple of games that you played but did not finish. They're in a little group of their own. Mm -hmm. There are three honorable mentions. And then we have... Um, mm -hmm a top five here. So we've got 10 games to talk about. A few of these are on my list as well, although I'm still shuffling mine into order. Um, I'm, I'm kind of procrastinating on it at this point. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, a few of these games are on my list as well, and I've played several of them. Um, so why don't, we, why don't we kick it off with those first ones? Yeah, absolutely. So the first game that we have here is one of the, the two that is in the did not finish um, category, but still made it onto this... Uh, this episode run, running mm -hmm. order, and that is Tunic. It's a strange little game, isn't it? It was long in it was long in production, um, and it seems that like when it when it came out, like all of the reviewers said that they'd seen it um, at trade shows and at E3s for years and years and years. So everyone seemed to know about Tunic, um, mm -hmm. and then when it actually came out, it was perhaps a little bit of a different game to what people were expecting because it is a very very cute isometric, um, Zelda, clearly very Zelda inspired. Um, action adventure with sword and shield um, you run around solving puzzles and so forth beautiful soft art style that looks like mm -hmm. looks like little soft plastic toys that you could uh, that you could poke like foam toys or something yeah um, and it also had a very very deep layers of puzzles that people seem very exciting about too so how was your experience with this one yeah uh, you know it's interesting you say that everyone thought they knew what it was and then it comes out and it's it's kind of the biggest mystery game of the year right um, mm -hmm. while they may have seen it uh, clearly the the main Thing that uh, drew me to it initially was that sense of discovery and you know people saying like man you are just going to like really have a time sort of figuring out the Gordian knot that is this game's systems which uh, noted or notedly it does not explain to you at all 
Um, so that sense of sort of unknown and mystery and surprise was really what I, I got the most out of this game. And I think the only reason I ended up not finishing it is uh, it got really hard at the end. And I think I don't mind a hard game, obviously. You know, we're going to talk about uh, FromSoft games <laughs> later in this cast, I'm sure. I love those. So I think maybe what it was is maybe like the options for me to fine tune that were a little too broad. Um, I, 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 or either that or I just got what I needed out of it. Um, at the end of the day, I, I really enjoyed my time with it. I just didn't finish it. Right, because if you played this one back at launch, um, it launched with basically two difficulties, one of which mm-hmm. was noted as normal and one of which was just a god yeah. mode, invincibility mode, right? So it's yeah. either <laughs> and normal in this game, in my view, is, is like super balls hearts. <laughs> and the mm-hmm. uh, easy, obviously, is just <laughs> invulnerability, and um, you know you just dance through the whole game. And I guess in that respect, it's maybe I, it's a game that I think of when I think of that is Celeste, actually, which is very, very difficult. Mm-hmm. And it, it has much more tweakable difficulty. Celeste does, but um, it's very, very hard. And you have that pure experience that everyone talks about and loves, and then you have the the option to just dance through it without taking any damage at all. Um, and the difficulty of tuning, they have added another mode since then, haven't they? Which is known as reduced difficulty mode, but that wouldn't have been available if you played it back at launch. Yeah, that's right. And, and that is when I played it. And, and you're absolutely right. It was sort of either all or nothing. And at that mm-hmm. point, at least, I, I, I think there was another option where it was just to turn off stamina. So you could sort of do rolling as much as you want and mm-hmm. you wouldn't run out of stamina when trying to get those iframes. But it still required a lot of precision. I, I think it would have made the game I, I, I don't know if necessarily the, the change in difficulty settings would have uh, made me go through it. I got really far <laughs> in, in Tunic mm-hmm. for what it's worth. Like I, uh, I think I was sort of in the run up to the final boss. Uh, and it just, um, you know, I think other things just started to catch my eye. And sometimes that's just how it is with, a, you know, a year is as full of good games as, as 2022 was. Um, mm-hmm. As good as a game is, if it's uh, not holding my interest throughout its runtime and something else is shiny on the other side, unless I have a very good reason, I'm just going to go. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. And, I mean, Tunic, Tunic is a game that can be spoiled as well, isn't it? You know, it has that, that manual mm-hmm. that you get the pages for that reveal. It's, yeah. There's a lot of things that seem to be hiding in plain sight in that game. Um, and people seem to really enjoy that element of it, of things that they... A little bit like something like Outer Wilds, I think. Like it would be possible for you to play that game and execute the solution of it on your first attempt, but it's just so convoluted and you have to learn so much by going through the game right that you have to build up a a set of knowledge that allows you to do that. And I think Tunic is in that same ballpark, right? It is. And I, I, I often wonder like what it would be like to revisit Tunic and start from the start knowing what I know about the world and the mechanics and you know what you can immediately execute on just with that knowledge. It's a lot different than you know something like a, a Dark Souls where uh, I've, I've always said like in that game, knowledge compresses space and time where like if you have played it before, you're going to be able to immediately come in and, and you sort of, sort of know the moves to make the strategy to like take basically you know five hours out of the first area compared to your first run through and um i i don't know if tunic would hold up in that same way just because all of it is so contingent on you being absolutely in the dark Mm -hmm. but um i don't know maybe one day i will revisit it and and whether i remember how it works or not will be the decider of that (laughs) Mm -hmm. yeah i had i played a little bit of tunic as well i I bounced little on it it was a little too hard for me um, but I, I've spoken mm-hmm. to people that played it, and loads of people are so fond of it. They're they're fond of it in quite a special way, I think. And like having the experience mm-hmm. described to me as the kind of game where you peel back petals almost and open up this experience. They speak of it in in that in that kind of that way, and I'm a little jealous of the, of having that experience because I I couldn't get my teeth into it. But the, the the reverence with which people talk about Tunic is quite special. You know what I think it's doing that that is causing that reaction, and because I felt this a little bit while I was playing it too, is it's recreating that sort of playground rumors thing that you used to get when you were a kid. And you know, I remember this with like the original Pokemon games, like oh, you know, if you go move this ice truck, there's a Mew hiding underneath it. And you know, obviously, mm-hmm. a lot of this stuff was false. And and talking about Tunic, it could be kind of treated the same way. But there's a lot of interesting stuff at Tunic that you sort of hear through the grapevine, or you know, in passing, or get hinted at from a tweet on on Twitter or something like that. And it makes you sort of 
have that sense of wonder that maybe hasn't been recaptured for a long time for a lot of folks in our uh, our cohort. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a nice way of looking at it, actually, because it, it definitely visually brings to mind those early Zelda games with the little green uniform. Um, and there's something delightfully... It's sort of signaling its retro intentions in the visual style, and it's really nice that that's... Mm-hmm. Um, lovingly recreated in the mystery and the gameplay as well as you're describing that old kind of guidebook style and yeah, getting tips from friends to get through it and stuff yeah it's not lost on me that the little fox is dressed like link <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah absolutely so good one um and the next game that you have here the other game that you didn't finish but wanted to include it's actually one of my favorites yeah. of the year and it's it's a very different one it's right on the other end of the spectrum to the lovely little indie yeah. tunic <laughs> um, and that is horizon forbidden west yeah, so I, uh, I I think this is the reason I didn't finish this is probably going to be obvious for a lot of people, but um, it came out very close to Elden Ring, <laughs> mm-hmm. yes. um, which which you'll find out was my my favorite game of the year, um, the Bullet. Um, but uh, Forbidden West, you know, I had recently played through uh, Horizon Zero Dawn. Actually, I, I played it sort of in preparation for Forbidden West coming out, um, and so I was very fresh on the story. And I think, man. Horizon as a series has such a great sort of backdrop for its its sci-fi story. And uh Horizon Forbidden West, like when I, I started playing it, I I enjoyed a, a lot of what it was doing, but I think um having just come off of Zero Dawn, it it very much is similar mechanically in in terms of the type of open world game it is. And contrasting that against some of the other open world games that came out here that are quite a bit different. Um, I'm looking at Arceus, I'm looking at Elden Ring. Um, those just, uh, I think it was maybe too much of a good thing uh, with um, uh, Forbidden West. And, and I do intend to revisit it, but I think it was just a point in time situation where I want to call out how much I liked it, how much I really thought it was probably one of the best looking games of the year, if not the best looking game of the year. Um, but uh, just wasn't in the cards at the time that I played it for me to finish it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think everyone had that problem, didn't it? Because it literally came out seven days before Elden Ring. Um, and I'm very much <laughs> like you. I'm a, I'm a Horizon Horizon fan, and I replayed the original in preparation for Forbidden West because mm-hmm. I was so excited about it. And as you say, the the hard sci-fi story of Horizon is, is just mind-bogglingly good. <laughs> um, some of the mysteries that you untangle in that first game. Um, and there's so such big questions left, even, at the end of it. Um, but yeah, I dived straight Even into this one. at the end of Forbidden one. West? Um, yes. <laughs> I think it's pretty clearly pl- <laughs> okay. plugged in here as part two of a, a three-part series. Mm. Um, okay. Well, I'm excited so, about that now. Yeah, but this this one, um, for me, Forbidden West was, I think my opinion of this one, it started off pretty high on my games of the year list, and it's it slid down over time. Um you know how that happens sometimes, like you'll retrospectively oh, yeah. ad- adjust your opinions. But I do think that Forbidden West improves on some of the things from Zero Dawn. Like they've tried to fix the climbing. They've cleaned up some of the the, the more um, Ubisoft-style map stuff. Mm. Um, Aloy can glide now. You have new mobility mecha- mechanics that open up that, that open world for even more exploration. Um, but on the other side of that coin, they've the story of the first game is so good um, and it's just some yeah. kind of alchemy where the pacing of it and the, the way that they spoon feed you the grand mysteries, the twin mysteries of number one, who is Aloy and number two, what yeah. on earth has happened to this strange world. It was just spectacularly good in the first one. And the second game um, continues that mystery and there's a lot of meat on the bones there, but it was it, the first game was hard to top in that respect, wasn't it? And I think that Forbidden West maybe stumbles a little bit there. Yeah, I'm, I'm absolutely with you on that. And, uh, you know, we're, we probably are going to run into this with uh, another game we're, we're talking about where it's following up a really great story with more of that story. And mm-hmm. sometimes, you know, the first the first blush is where you have the, the biggest impact there. Um, but uh, Zero Dawn was, you know, I, I almost, uh, truth be told, I almost put it down because I think it was almost a little too um, suspenseful in the way that it, it initially got you um, into that story. I think they they held off um uh, sort of revealing what the the stakes and the the reasoning behind the the central mystery of the game were um 
quite long into an, a pretty lengthy open world game. And while I really like, I, I think it was a gigantic payoff um, if and when you finally got there, I, I was just a bit worried that, that folks might fall off a little early from that. Uh, clearly you and I didn't, and, and we were rewarded for it. <laughs> yeah, they definitely did that. Um, I seem to remember that they set you up with this beautiful opening in the first game where you see Aloy as a child and mm. you're kind of, you're bought into her life and, and who she is and so forth. And then she sets out on the big adventure to discover it all. Um, and they, they put some of the, the very first clues or the first big reveals that are the next steps in that story at the complete other end of the map. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you really do have to, you have to unfog an awful lot of map before you get your next breadcrumbs. And I think that you're right that, um, that first game had the misfortune of coming out at the same time as Breath of the Wild. And so a lot of people fell off yep. the horizon to go and play Breath of the Wild. And then they had the, the misfortune again of this one coming out with another genre redefining open world masterpiece. Um, and it seems like, like bless them, um, Gorilla have done the, the same yeah. thing twice. <laughs> I was going to say, it's someone has to... Um, let these guys catch a break. I mean, coming out with two sort of at least, you know, game of the year contenders uh, uh, hot on their heels is it's just terrible luck. Um, this mm -hmm. is a, I wouldn't call it a, a cursed uh, series in any regard because it's, it's clearly doing fine. You know, they've got two games under their belt, another one coming as you, you've just told me um, most likely and then a TV show. So, you know, at the end of the day um, they're taking punches, but uh, they're still getting up. They're still swinging. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I do think that you're right about the, the look of this game too. It's, it's some of the best, uh, facial mocap that I've ever seen, um, and that even that first Horizon game, there's something about the way that they design the wilderness, so that like when you're close to water, you see buzzing flies, and as you move mm. into more arid areas, the the plants change, the wildlife changes, and the the way that the weather is so dynamic and beautiful, and the way that the light works, that decimate engine that Hideo Kojima is using yeah. now. It's pretty special, I think, what they've managed to pull off with the, the engine for that game and with the, the art choices that they've made. And they've even managed to um, up it again with Forbidden West. And I think that you're right. It's it's one of the best looking games that I've ever seen, I think. And, and that really helps with an open world game because it's such a an experiential, exploratory type of game where you're just climbing a mountain to see the view, you know. And when the view is as good as it is in Forbidden West, it's it's really special. Absolutely. And I think, you know, for all of the technology that's being thrown at, at Forbidden West, um, we can't discount the the impact that the art direction and, and sort of the, uh, the overall concept is, is fueling how good it looks. Like, um, one, the use of colors in Forbidden West is just incredible. It's so colorful. It's so vibrant. And then two, the sort of ruined world and, you know, um, a village built in the shadows of gigantic solar arrays or, or something like that. It's just mm -hmm. things that you know, it, it looks like a, a sort of just the most wild sci-fi concept art you've ever seen, but turned into this extremely high fidelity open world game, which um, it's a feat. It's a, a heck of a thing they did there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for me, I, I would say that of the, you know, the Game Awards this year, there was a lot of Elden Ring, a lot of uh, Ragnarok <laughs> and Horizon was there too. Um, notionally as part of a big AAA3 you know, <laughs> but was completely passed yeah. over. And I, I was sad to, sad to see that because, you know, um, for me, I think Horizon is perhaps the game that I enjoyed the most of those three. Um, but I think that that's a, a minority, an extreme minority opinion. <laughs> well, hey, I mean, you know, I, I, everybody has their tastes. And, and to that end, like, I think it's nice that in an, uh, a year like this, especially on, in the wake of... Um, you know, the pandemic, which threw a bunch of games off their release schedules. It's just nice that all or all three of those games came out in this year. You know, mm -hmm. I, I'm really glad to see that and that they all came out and were as good as they were. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I can't complain there, but I hear you in that uh, uh, there were some clear front runners in that group just with regards to the impact mm -hmm. they had on the broader gaming community as it is. Mm hmm. Right, and the next couple that you've got here are actually games that I have not played, so I'm quite interested to hear you um, tell me about them. Um, the first of them is, yeah, sure. I believe it's a pixel art RPG, right? Um, or is it maybe a tactics game? It's Triangle Strategy. Yeah, yeah so this is uh, Triangle Strategy is sort of uh, Final Fantasy Tactics meets Game of Thrones. And I don't know if you played Octopath Traveler, but this is um, 
those same developers and they they use that same sort of HD 2D engine where they have a pixel art sort of foreground characters and animations and then sort of pre-rendered um uh, lighting and backgrounds with a lot of sort of bloom and more modern effects. So it, it has this really striking look. Um, but to that end, it's also um, a, a game that we haven't seen a lot of until this year when all of a sudden they release like seven of them for some reason, which is the, <laughs> the tactics RPG, you know, grid based, character based tactics game. And I, I have a history with these games. Like I really loved Final Fantasy Tactics back in the day. And so when uh, triangle strategy came out i i knew that i wanted to play it and I, I convinced josh to come along with me and, and we had a really good time playing and discussing that game for the mm-hmm. cast right so do you think that this one does it iterate upon the uh the, the tenets of this genre that you've been into does it do something new and exciting or is it like um like just a classic example of it i would say there's a lot of modern um quality of life things that they did and uh, you could Back in the day for like, say, its its predecessor and clear influence, Final Fantasy Tactics, um, that's a hard game. And generally speaking, you know, uh, older RPGs like this, Tactics or not, um, you'll probably ex- be expected to do some side content, some grinding to make sure that you're up to snuff for the next big story battle. What Triangle Strategy did with that is it streamlined what it was doing with battles in favor of having just a ton of story content. The weird thing, and I think the thing most people will tell you about uh, Triangle Strategy is that it is probably 75% cutscenes, And then there's like uh, um, the other uh, 25% is the actual tactics battles, which mm-hmm. are really well done, really polished. And the interesting thing is it, it's not a fan of making you replay content. If you lose a battle, um, heaven forbid, you will retain all the experience you get. All of your characters will gain levels. All the material that they gather will be counted. And you'll take that and then enter back into the battle with those gained levels instead of making you like, say, load a save as it would have before. So Mm -hmm. it wants you to keep moving forward through it. It wants you to see the story. It's using the tactics as a way to convey that, but also as like the key mechanical hook. But Mm -hmm. it's not um, it's not punitive with regards to how it does its difficulty, which I really liked. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hearing you describe it makes me think of um, the latter day Fire Emblem games, actually, where there's a social Mm -hmm. and story element interspersed with the actual tactics gameplay yeah you're, you're hitting on something here because i was a huge uh, fan of fire emblem three houses uh, in the year that that came out i think it was back in 2018 um but yeah i uh, i loved that game i think this is quite a bit different uh, the story is um you know a little less on the the anime side of things a little more on the sort of trying to ape game of thrones or you know tactics ogre which by the way um as a, a quick aside, that game came out this year, and I am currently playing it, Tactics mm-hmm. Ogre Reborn. Um, a really interesting counterpoint to this game because it is much more uh, deep mechanical side and a lot less in terms of the cutscenes. So I think if you play both of these games, you know you have an extra hundred hours in your life. I'm sure, right? Um, <laughs> you could get a really po- interesting point counterpoint. Mm-hmm. And would you say that? I mean, I. I've got some history with this. Like I remember playing Advance Wars way back on the Game Boy Advance and was yeah. really into these games back in the day and Vandal Hearts and things like that. But it's been quite a while mm-hmm. for me. I, I did touch on Into the Breach this year and played that one for the first time. And that was like a nice um, taste of, of this genre that I haven't played for so long. Um, but do you think that Triangle Strategy yeah. would be a good place for people to to try out um, this kind of tactics genre? Or is it one that's more for the fans? I would say that from a mechanical perspective, it is pretty um, refined. And I, I think even folks that are maybe been away from the genre for a while could get into it. But I will caveat that by saying you have to be um, willing to put up with the game's um, quite expository nature of telling its story. Like there's a lot of um, interesting decisions that are made, but you're getting a lot of uh, as I said before, cutscenes where they're, um, you know, telling you about uh, the continent of Norzelia and the three kingdoms that are vying for its mm-hmm. um, uh, its various resources. And yeah, I, I would say like you're not going to hit a barrier with this game in terms of being able to progress through it from um, a tactics perspective. If you're going to fall off of Triangle Strategy, it's because you're just not there for that much um, that much dialogue and cutscenes. Yeah, I think there, I think I, th- I remember seeing a demo for this one, so I might actually um, see if that demo is still up and give it a try. Yeah, I would. I would recommend it. And there's, hey, no, um, 
a no better way to to see and i believe the demo that they put out actually transfers save over into the main game if you decide mm-hmm. to continue on with it so okay um check me on that but uh if that is the case then i would totally recommend uh checking out the demo because I, I i will say it gets off to a little bit of a slow start like i don't know if you are or were a game of thrones fan but it has this very much similar opening act where there's a lot of major characters meeting in one very big capital city to you know partake in some event and mm-hmm. it throws a ton of names at you really fast so um you just have to sort of be prepared for that type of uh you know initial um act one event going into it mm-hmm. so one for fans of the high fantasy books with all of the names at court and the the internal politics and all of that stuff exactly yes mm-hmm. courtly politics is the name of the game right yeah, and I'm absolutely loving the diversity of this list so far. We've got like the the Dark Souls soft toy <laughs> indie game Tunic. We've got the AAA Polish Horizon Forbidden West. We've got crunchy pixel art and uh, tactics and triangle strategy. And the next one is another swerve again. And um, this one is completely yeah. different kind of game. It's another one that I haven't tried actually, although I believe this one is available for iOS via Netflix, which means that I could try it for free. And this one is... Point P. Point P. Yes. Um, so how how did you how did you is that how am I saying that right? It's Point P, right? Your guess is as good as mine, but I think so. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, yeah. So Point P. Um, I really, you know, this was a, a surprise of the year for me. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the game's predecessor, Downwell, uh, which was another sort of pixel art, uh, run based roguelike sort of thing by a Japanese indie developer, Ajiro Fumoto. And um, Mm -hmm. when this came out, and and especially in the way that it did for this sort of weird Netflix gaming service thing, I just like, I couldn't have been more surprised. And um, Point P, I guess to briefly describe what it is, is a vertical action platformer where you are sort of bouncing off the walls and collecting fruit to feed a dragon who is chasing you up up the, the chasm as it is. And so you're bouncing back and forth, grabbing these different colored fruits to make the juice for the dragon, which will keep him from breathing fire on you and killing you. Um, It's a bizarre, absurd, making juice fun game. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. It's, it's really fun. It's a great mobile game. You know, you can do a a run in under a few minutes, especially if you're bad at it like me. Um, And um, it's, it's pretty, you know, it's, it's got a, a great aesthetic. It's really colorful. It has wonderful music, although for a mobile game, that's maybe less important. Um, but you know, the, the fact that it came out on this Netflix service is so interesting to me because I'm looking at like what has come out on there since this sort of new piece of content came out. And and as you said, like into the breach came out on there now they've got rains and oxen free and Kentucky rot zero and spirit fairer. Like there are some serious games on that service now. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think I saw a little footage of Point P. I haven't actually tried it, but it looks like you it uses the touch screen, right? So do you have to kind of fling your mm-hmm. character up the screen? Is that how it works? That's exactly how it works. So what it'll do is it'll, um, as you your little character is this little green sort of bulbous guy, you will uh, click on him and sort of fling him like an angry bird, if you will. You know, that's uh, probably mm-hmm. a common mechanical hook that everyone will recognize you. Um, drag your finger in the opposite direction, slingshot style that you want point P to go. And um, the action on the screen will freeze while you're sort of setting up your shot. And then you release and um, point P will fling off into, you know, the wild blue yonder and hopefully catch the fruit that you want to catch. And, Mm -hmm. you know, it's a big uh, mechanical hook of like trying to bounce the, the character off of various enemies or debris or pots or, you know, what have you that's, that's littering this chasm. And, um, you know, setting up combos where you're getting all of the fruit without landing because um, the the main thing that's going to cause you to fail is if you land before you're able to get the fruit to feed the dragon, uh, you know, if you if you don't give him the right juice, he's not a happy dragon. And so, um, <laughs> you know, that's where uh, that's where your runs end uh, most of the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're right. It's an interesting presence there on on Netflix. It's 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 a slightly inscrutable and confusing selection that they have going on but this one this one is out of place as a new game it's it reminds me a little bit of you know the playstation plus service when they they announced that this was going to be a new game pass rival and started off with um stray like one of the best indie games of the year and suddenly yeah everything seemed very exciting like wow maybe it is like you know Mm -hmm. a new game pass for playstation but then you know for the next 
six months or something. They've just been releasing very, very familiar titles from across the last few years. Um, and so Stray just kind of stands alone on PlayStation Plus as the the new one. And I guess Point P is a little bit positioned yeah. similarly on Netflix, isn't it? It is. And it's. I think that's really interesting because, you know, I, I'm not sure what they're trying to do with this service because all of these games, like, there's a lot of indies on here. One, uh, they're almost all indies. Um, and, like, I think that's great. But I'm wondering if, like, the people who are in the audience for these indie games have not already played it before their Netflix subscription suddenly told them they have a new place that they could be playing it. Mm -hmm. Um, On the other hand, it is interesting that a lot of these games are ones that have not been on iOS before. So if all we're getting out of this arrangement with Netflix is a bunch of great games ported to iOS, and then, you know, whenever their licensing runs out with Netflix, they can just put it on the app store or something, then sure, fine. As long as it's helping more people play these cool games, I'm I'm here for it, I guess. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I was interested to see Immortality pop on pop up on um, on Netflix. I wonder how that one plays on touchscreen. That yeah. was that's going to be on my my games of the year list, and um, I was very happy about the idea of more people p- finding it and playing it. So you know, I wonder I wonder how many people that are playing Netflix games are um, just randomly sort of plucking them because they they are there and they see them on their Netflix account. You know. Yeah, I, I would love that, except for the fact that I think the whole Netflix game side of things is so poorly like um, advertised that that mm-hmm. I highly doubt that, that that could be the case, right? Like, I didn't really know about it until I was told, and I feel pretty plugged into this thing. Like, this mm-hmm. wasn't something I was anticipating. You know, someone had to literally, like, tap me on the shoulder or, you know, I see it on Twitter from someone I follow or something like that, that this even existed. So I, I'd love to... Uh, to, to come along with you on the ride that people are going to discover Point P or Into the Breach or Immortality through Netflix, but I, I just can't really see that being the case, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. Yeah, fair enough. But the one that's winning when it comes to subscription services for me is, is absolutely Game Pass. And looking at my own like oh, work yeah. in progress games <laughs> of the year now, there is, uh, let me see, three, four, f- for half of the games on my games of the year list, work in progress, are on Game Pass. And one of them is a game that you've selected here, Citizen Sleeper. It's riding high on my list too. absolutely fantastic game this is one of the more memorable games that i've played this year i think it's um it's by gareth damian martin who did in other waters previously and it's a Mm -hmm. a tabletop inspired um, sci-fi story-led game using dice mechanics and elements of chance and strategy to unfold this uh, beautifully told um, story on a space station called erlin's eye at the start of the game you mm-hmm. arrive as a, a refugee who is unpacked from a, a derelict ship, um, and you are an android who needs a certain drug to survive. You have to source that drug. You have to you have to find food. You have to find shelter, and you just have to carve out a life on a, on Erlin's eye. So there's a sense of precarity and adventure. Um, this was a really really great game. So what was it that uh, that made you stick Citizen Sleeper onto your own list here? Yeah, I think that sense of precarity you kind of nailed it. Like everything in this game sort of hangs together and and points towards this message about living in a capitalism dominated society surviving with a disability and or requiring medication you know it is uh, a hard place to be in in a place where the things you need to live are contingent upon you being useful to someone or something uh, at least useful enough that they can pay you enough to get the medicine you need Um, it has a beautiful story with a ton of really affecting stories and characters, you know, whether it's a bartender, a dock worker, a hacker, or a noodle salesman. Um, at the end of the day, it's all people you're, you know, learning more about and having dealings with, you know, having transactions with. Um, and it is just enough mechanic, uh, mechanical hooks to keep you engaged. You know, you mentioned this dice thing, um, you know, choosing where you place your high dice and low dice was always really an interesting choice to be made. 
and you know using that to make sure that you're getting what you need to keep your condition bar as you said you need this drug to survive as an android and your stamina bar which is you know uh, having food energy to to live it, it was just a really beautiful sort of survival game meets visual novel that uh, you know just hooked me entirely through its playthrough and runtime mm-hmm. yeah it's it's mechanically engaging isn't it i think that when i think back to my time with citizen sleeper i it's one of those games where i get a mood i can feel the mood of it like that that cold electronic mm-hmm. music and those architectural drawings that you're looking at as you move around erlin's eye and those lovely descriptions mm-hmm. of the people that you meet and the kind of you know, a lot goes on in your imagination in this game, in that visual novel, in that text-heavy game style, right, where you're, you're reading descriptions of people, of smells, of scenes, and sort of thing, and all of that sort of thing. But at the same time, the mechanics of it are great. There is something quite addictive about, at the start of each day, rolling all of your dice. Maybe you've got a one, a two, a three, two sixes, mm-hmm. and choosing where to spend them. Um, to make these little time wheels click around. So you've got your spinning plates of so many different tasks, some of which yes. um, your survival is entirely based on, some of which are you know, being pursued by someone. You have to get settled and set for this uh, encounter that is coming, and others that might in- involve helping other people. Or it's, it's a really interesting mix, and it does allow you to, in a way that I really enjoy, choose what you find interesting and pursue that in this world, which I think definitely contributed to that that sense of freedom that you get in this game and yeah yeah you said addicting and i i definitely felt sort of a one more day one more turn uh thing going on with citizen sleeper when i was playing it you know i just wanted to see how this one particular arc um finishes up or what happens next with this character and um i think the really nice thing it does that we're kind of alluding to through all of these you know placing dice, finding resources, ticking up timers over the course of several days is it has really good short, medium, and long-term goals. You know, mm-hmm. you have the the short-term goals of survival, the medium term of completing this task for a, a certain faction, and the long term of eventually sort of building a life on this space station. It's mm-hmm. just a really well well done game and all those things are sort of pushing in the same direction, which is uh, sort of a key for what I like in a game. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> yeah, and I absolutely think about that the idea of arriving somewhere new and being, you know, slightly lost and it all being so unfamiliar and strange, it's a, a sense that, like in my own life, I definitely think of as a kind of a first day at a new school kind of feeling. Yeah. <laughs> Where the smells are yeah, strange absolutely. and it looks strange and you feel a little out of place and unsure. And something about the way that this game is written and put together summoned that feeling up in me. And I hadn't felt that for a while, you know. So it was really um, interesting and quite emotional to play that game. I think it was just such a lovely one, such a sensitive one. This one, yeah, yeah. What what table am I going to sit at at lunch? Uh, who's going to mm-hmm. let me um, let me hang out with them on the playground? I I definitely hear you on that. It's it's such a good callback. A, a lot of playground talk on this um, crossover between gaming <laughs> and wild and pixelated playgrounds. Yes. Ironically, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and Citizen Sleeper as well. I, I I think I like that Gareth clearly has. Um, thoughts about society and thoughts about technology and thoughts about so many different things and they're all packed into this game in the various storylines that you untangle throughout it as well so there's just a lot of meat on the bones and a lot to think about you know mm-hmm. it's, it's a really yeah, lovely and, one and i like how i totally agree with you and I, I really like how all of the various relationships you have like some of them turn out great you know you you make friends that will sort of determine your path through the game and will dictate how it ends but then there's also others that don't have your best interests at heart like there's just people that are straight out there to take advantage of you and and your skills and while they're going to give you a pittance for you know salvaging some materials or repairing some engineering equipment like at the end of the day um it's a it's a harsh reality that the game um the citizen sleeper puts out there for you on Erlen's eye. And, um, it, it doesn't pull any punches with regards to how, how that affects your character. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Great one. Um, I've actually been replaying it and I'm, I'm loving it just as much <clears throat> on the second playthrough. I picked a different class and I'm going through it again and it feels oh, yeah. fresh again to play. Uh, but the next game that you've got on your list here is another one that for me, I think the thing that I loved most about this game and it's on my list too Again, it's it's loaded with atmosphere. Um, this game mm-hmm. created one of the most 
probably the most memorable environment that I moved through this year in my gaming life. Um, and this one is Stray. <laughs> Uh, the cat game, the famous oh, yeah. cat game, Stray, <laughs> the viral <yeah. laughs> cat game. <laughs> so what was it that caught your attention about this one? Yeah, the, the viral cat game of, of 2022. <laughs> um, so I think in- initially, you know, it was just sort of the, um, I guess the the movement and an atmosphere of moving about through this walled city, you know, City 99, I, I think it was, as as a cat was just so novel. You know, I think... It was one of those game concepts that you wonder why it hadn't been done before, you know, playing as a cat and exploring a abandoned city. It just, it makes so much sense. The internet loves cats. The internet loves exploring beautiful environments and video games. Um, This was a match made in heaven. And I think all of the influences that they brought into this game with like Kowloon Walled City and um, some of those apartments that were just so well lit and realized, Mm -hmm. uh, it it was just such an interesting thing to behold. I I don't think the mechanics in it necessarily like held up for its whole runtime, but it was so short that it didn't like grate on me or anything. It was was a great experience throughout for for that reason for me. Short, sweet, and beautiful. Yeah, absolutely. Um, This this felt like a game that I'd been waiting for for so long, and it's one of those ones that finally comes out, you get it downloaded, and then play it in one evening. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and it's over before it even yeah. feels like it began. Yeah, but um, I remember thinking for this one, because we were watching it for so long, that I think the thing that was going to make it live or die for me, um, the only thing that I was worried about was um, cats are incredibly agile, incredibly mobile, have so much balance, and are so graceful, and you know move in such interesting ways. And I was thinking, how on earth are they going to make the player feel um, that sense of you know cat-like mobility in a game? Because it the way that cats move just makes controlling it with like a, you know, a couple of sticks and a couple of buttons feel like it would be a, a tall order. Um, but what they actually did wasn't <laughs> what I was expecting. And I was quite impressed with it actually, because in this game, um, I don't think I've played anything quite like it in this way. Cause in most platform games or games where you are climbing, etc., you hit the button to jump. Mm-hmm. Um, and when you hit that button, your character moves in this game. Yep. There is like a, a little floating cursor that sort of skirts different jumpable surfaces uh, surfaces all around you um and it's i think it is it when you release the button the cat jumps to the yes. point the point that you've selected it's very interesting isn't it it's interesting what they went with here to try and capture that that cat like movement yeah i guess the the answer to how do they make you feel like a cat is parkour right like this is basically um you know parkour runners the the felines of the athletic world as we all know um the uh the movement feels uh, it weirdly like Assassin's Creed free run, except a lot faster. Like you're accelerating much more quickly. You can turn on a dime and you never ever, um, stumble and fall, uh, and, you know, sort of face first into the ground. Uh, you're always doing something pretty graceful because you're a cat, you know, cats always land on their feet. That's the, the old adage. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was very, very interesting way that they did it. It's like, um, I've described this one as a platform selecting game rather than a platforming yeah. game because you're kind of you're, you're you're aiming and you never miss and it's really in in the aiming isn't it but the uh, the sensibility of it yeah, as well was just such a beautiful surprise this one yeah and i, I think i was i was initially surprised uh, having played it that it just kept introducing new interesting areas like that first sort of slums area that that you enter in Mm -hmm. stray sticks out to me as having a lot of really beautiful portions and uh, interesting places to explore and sneak into and squeeze through and it was just really great and then finding out there's a whole you know another two really large scale environments like that to explore throughout the course of the later portions that game was a surprise and and a delight for me like Mm -hmm. i didn't expect it you know for being a small indie project with a short runtime to have that much going on but i'm i'm glad it did yeah, and I was hugely impressed as well with this one in that sort of playing <coughs> the, the camera down at cat height, um, which is an unusual perspective to be viewing a world. Um, and you really do feel that. You feel you feel that camera being so low down so that you can walk under chairs mm-hmm. and that you can slip through spaces that you don't expect to be able to slip through and that your gamer brain maybe doesn't automatically identify. But somewhere in this huge, beautiful, textured, cluttered environment full of 
you know, humming air cons on the outside of buildings that you can hop up. And your, your eye is drawn to them because they have these tassels being blown by the fans um, and neon light that just yeah. draws the eye beautifully. Um, and even if there is just one tiny smashed window pane on the side of a huge apartment building, somehow this game, the design of this game just shepherds you towards it and you will find that spot. And I, I found that amazing throughout this game. That sometimes there were such small spaces that you had to identify um, and the game managed to yeah. to bring you to them in this in this really big world. Yeah, I think they're they're definitely taking a page out of the Valve handbook here. You know, I feel like in something like a Half Life, there's always such great pathfinding and you know directing the player's eyes towards where they need to be. And and they definitely they learned that lesson very well for Stray. Um, the developers did and took it to heart. Um, a couple things, uh, you know, that was one thing that I I loved that and um, the the overall. Atmosphere, but one thing that I I thought was an interesting choice was um, the the other characters in this game were all robots, and you of course had your little drone companion B twelve, um, mm-hmm. who you know it was sort of along with you and you know talking to you, um, you know implying the existence of this sentient cat, I suppose. Um, I just thought that the game was definitely stronger for me when it was focusing more on, as you were saying, the exploratory aspects, being a cat, squeezing into small locations, and maybe a little less so when it was, you know, doing fetch quests for robots. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, I think if there is a downside for Stray for me, I think it was maybe the action segments where you're, um, mm-hmm. there's some stealth mechanics that's just about, they're, they're serviceable, I would say. And then there are chase yeah. segments that were, maybe the least fun part of the game. Um, but the, the real joy of this one is definitely in the exploration in those several hub areas that you've described where you just, you feel very, very free. And it's such a, a rich textured environment. I think one of the, the critiques mm-hmm. that this game has gotten is that, you know, people just like it because it's a cat. Um, and the things yeah. that I like <laughs> about this game, like the cat, sure, that's great. But the, the world that they've built here, and as you've said, this, this android society that's trapped in darkness mm-hmm. and they are quite existentially challenged and they're trying to yeah. carve out a life and a way of being in this this f- damp dripping closed city it's it's a wonderful piece of sci-fi really it is yeah and and while i i maybe didn't enjoy doing fetch quests for them i did find the characters of the companions i believe is what the the robots were were called um i did find their various stories to be pretty interesting you know the um the one who's taken up as the guard um they, they all sort of seem to have this uh thing where they're hanging onto the vestiges of their you know previous human counterparts and uh you know first as tragedy some of the stories are very sad and then as farce where there's some things that are just ridiculous like there's a robot on the street busking busking for what you may ask well, <laughs> does he need money no he doesn't need to eat so it's just sort of funny um where this game decides to go with how it characterized these um these sentient robot companions mm-hmm. yeah and the fact that it's made by a french um development team as well there is a certain i don't know how to put it quite because it is it is based in that um, Southeast Asian environment, but there is a little bit of mm-hmm. Frenchness, I think, in the the existential absurdity that you encounter on your journey through this um, this Android world. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a nice perspective, and, and you know, it's um, I think we've had a, a few games out of um, out of France this year. I'm trying to remember the other one that, that's coming. I to guess mind, but Plague yeah, Tale I, was I maybe do. the big one, right? Oh yeah, that's a good point. I haven't played it yet, but it's definitely on my list. That's on on my my very long list of Game Pass games that I need to check out still. <laughs> mm-hmm. Right, and funnily enough, number four in your top five here is a game that I started um, yesterday. Um, it's yeah my my first ever Pokemon game, which I think is you know um, an important box to tick on my my gamer card here. Um, so, are you are you um, a long standing fan of of, of the series? Oh yeah, so um, I was sort of in the exact um, wheelhouse for Pokemon to hit me in a big bad way back in uh, you know grade school. Basically, um, I was a, a sort of in the first uh, wave of children indoct- indoctrinated into the the Pokemon uh, world in America back in whenever Red and Blue came to the states. Um, so yeah, I, I can't say I've stuck with the series throughout all of its various incarnations over the years, but um, you know after taking a long break after. Um, those initial few um, series, I, I came back in for Arceus this year. I haven't played the newest ones yet. I heard they came out a little 
a little pre-baked <laughs> um, mm-hmm. um, scarlet mm-hmm. and violet that is. But um, Arceus, I, I really thought was interesting. And I find it really interesting that that's your first one because this game is a huge departure from the series in general. Right. I was, I've been wanting to try Pokemon for, forever, but there are so many games to to choose from. You're like, where do I begin? Should I start back at the start with the old retro yeah. ones? How do these new ones hold up? And the advice that I got in, mm. in the Gaming in the Wild Discord, actually, someone said to me, just find one that you like the the aesthetic of and the look of, and you like the look yeah. of the Pokemon. Find one that just makes you happy and pick that one. Um, and so that's what I did, actually. I just leafed through, you know, I looked at Sword and Shield, and I looked at some of the uh, the pixel art ones. But something about the visual style of Arceus, it had a little bit of Breath of the Wild, a little bit of Studio Ghibli, and something about it just, yeah. just spoke to me. So, yeah, dived in for this one. But it's very interesting that um, if this one is significantly um, you know, off-piste compared to the, the main thrust of the uh, the series. Yeah. Well, let me let me give you my, my take on why that is, and, and maybe you can tell me, I guess, uh, if you agree with my, my assessment. But, um, you know, this was, uh, you mentioned about, like, knowing the first game that you, you knew you'd be talking about at the end of the year. This game came out back in January, and I, I played it right, uh, pretty much right when it came out. And I, I thought it was something special right away because it's so different than all of the other games in the Pokemon series, really. I think if there's one thing the mainline Pokemon series has that you can count on is it has a formula, right? There are eight gyms, there are three starters, there are, um, you know, the elite four at the end, and then you become the the champion and got to catch them all. But um, Arceus kind of throws all that out the window. There's no gyms. Uh, you're sort of in a colonial time warp adventure. Like you are clearly from the present, but you are transported to the past. The game makes this clear explicitly up front and you get a cell phone from God, I think. <laughs> um, it's it's a bizarre opening, but it, it it quickly sort of just catapults you into the wilderness and says, hey, we don't know really anything about these Pokemon, but um, go out there and see if you can catch a few so we can study them some more. And um, what this game does that I loved, and maybe this mm-hmm. is the Souls fan in me that um, is coming out is, it does not stray away from putting you in danger right away. Like there is a, there are alpha Pokemon out there and they are big and highly leveled and they will destroy you if given a chance and you will stumble into them very, very quickly and and learn to look out for them. So I think that all of those things I just mentioned are, are completely away from that formula. And I think that's why I maybe appreciated Arceus so much compared to its predecessors. Mm Mm-hmm. Right, and this one, um, is this the first one that's had Pokemon Legends and then Arceus? Have there been other Pokemon Legends game, or do you think this is the start of a new strand? Yeah, this is this is the start of a new thing. Like, uh, all the other ones are sort of in that, uh, all the other sort of mainline ones are in that sort of, you know, there's two versions, they have a color or, you know, a mineral or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but... Um, the, yeah, this is this is sort of the start of a, a new it's a series or, or side series, uh, a Pokemon Gaiden, if you will. Um, and I, I I hope it continues because I I like this formula. I like the fact that it's less directed. It's more about just throwing you out there and saying, "Hey, explore this world, catch some Pokemon." I like that it's modeless. There's no like flashing screen and you go into the battle screen. It's just right there, out on Front Street. Um, mm-hmm. And I think. Another thing is there's a ton of content here. Like uh, after beating the game after like 25 or so hours, as I understand it, there's just a ton of post game content as well that I I have yet to delve into. But I know it's waiting there for me if I, I ever feel like it. I suppose. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm very excited to get more into it. Actually, um, well, how are you know, yeah? How are you? How are you finding it, John? I uh, I, I I guess as a first time Pokemon player, to, what what are, what are your thoughts? Right. Well, I I didn't quite know what to expect. You know, I've, I've been a little intimidated by the Pokemon series and felt like I'd missed the boat on it to some degree. You know, like um, I was um, mm. my Nintendo upbringing was like started with Mario, Super Mario World, and Super Metroid, and a link to the past and all of that stuff. And I, I kind of missed Animal Crossing and Pokemon as they sailed on by. Um, and now everyone thinks of those as the big Nintendo games. <laughs> you know, and my my precious metroid is relegated way to the back of the line i love metroid too (laughs) but it was really nice to actually finally dive into it and this one um i was really pleasantly surprised and kind of hooked it just had that it's it's such a an optimistic world in some way you know and your character with these big glassy eyes and just a big smile and these beautiful little creatures that just bring a (laughs) smile to your face which i guess is perhaps the essence of what people love about pokemon isn't it it's the pokemon themselves 
Yes, it's it's all about the creatures. It's all about sort of the you know you're uh, a kid off on his his first big adventure. That's always the the sort of framing. This one is different in that you're a kid thrown through time, I guess. <laughs> but mm-hmm. um, um, yeah, it's it still at least has that um, continuation of of theme. And you know, I think I'm glad. I think this, like I said, is an interesting one to start with. But at the end of the day, like. I think stepping into Pokemon wherever you do, like the first one is always going to be, I guess, quote unquote, your favorite, right? Like, uh, mm-hmm. you know, it's the one you'll hold the fondest memories for. People say this about the Persona series too. Your favorite Persona game is the first one you play. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, and I was surprised that it got me. It got me quite how it did. Yeah, it really got me right from the off, you know, and I was thinking, am I going to be into this, like catching these little creatures? Um, and the first, my little starter Pokemon that I just got, he was like a little beautiful little owl ball <laughs> just came <laughs> over to me um, i absolutely fell in love with it absolutely instantly and i was like oh my god this thing is my absolute new best friend so i guess i got got by pokemon <laughs> yeah i mean there's a, a lot to be said for cute critters um see stray um right but yeah i i I'm I'm interested to see how you continue on with that game. Um for what it's worth, I think we'll we may be doing a podcast on Arceus at some point. So um yeah, we'll we'll see. Uh, I'll flesh out those thoughts more, but um I'm really glad they sort of turned over this new leaf for the series and and tried this more open world, I guess sort of action oriented rather than the the more traditional approach and I, I can only hope they, you know, take the learnings from this. Uh, clearly, they didn't take all of them into Scarlet and Violet, but maybe, maybe into the next iteration or another Legends game. Who knows? Yeah, absolutely. It does. It feels like the the, you know, the uh, the convoy of um, mainline Pokemon games has just kept chugging along um, in its usual uh, route. And this little offshoot was actually, you know, it, it was very highly rated at the time, and I kind of kept my powder try and managed to not get sucked in by the hype and jump on it immediately. <laughs> but here at the end of the year, I was thinking I want a cozy Nintendo game to play over the holidays. So it got me eventually. And yeah, the good reviews of this one and the, the positive sentiment from the, uh, the fan base <clears throat> and from critics would suggest that they must, they must build on this, right? Yeah. If, if it was an experiment, then I would say it was a successful one. Um, and, you know, that that mainline series is such a revenue generator and Pokemon is such a juggernaut on its own. Like at this point, the the video games are the vestigial arm of what is used to tell, you know, sell plushies and uh, movies and, and everything else under the sun that's Pokemon branded. But I'm glad, you know, they're still there. And I'm also glad that they're continuing to, to iterate on them, however much they are. Um, mm-hmm. uh, you know, Arceus maybe being a better example of that than the, the latest outing from from what I understand. Um, I'm sure I'll play Scarlet and Violet at some point, or one of the two at least, and then um, and I'll have I'll I'll see what that's all about. Mm-hmm. Well, I will keep on playing it as well. I'm I'm having a great time with it um, here in my Christmas break, and I'll look forward to your episode on that one. Um, but that leads yeah. us to your top three of the year. Um, the first of which, yeah, number three is a game that is also sailing high on my list. This was a a pixel art um, visual novel. Um, of a type? I mean, how how would you even describe this one? This is Norco. Yeah, Norco. So Norco is very much in the the realm of classic point and, and click pixel art adventure games, but I think it strips down the mechanical aspects of the, the, that quite a bit. You know, there's no pixel hunting really to be said here. It's it's much more about giving you a story about a world. And it is a extremely compelling world. You know, this is uh, set in the town of Norco, which is outside of uh, New Orleans, Louisiana, uh, host to a large refinery. Uh, that is all true in real life, as it is in this game. But the game, uh, uh, very interestingly, is set sort of in a, uh, like, five minutes in the future, it seems like, except there's also AI and robots and uh, even worse hyper-capitalism than there is in the present. Um, but it is, it's a really compelling sort of world, and it gives you such an amazing sense of place. You know, it really does feel like you're coming back to your hometown because all the people know you and you're hearing all their stories and history. Uh, I just, I got really into it. And, and our podcast that we did and, and discussing this game, Josh and I, was one of my favorites just because there's so much here, you know? How did you mm-hmm. find it, John? Yeah, this one, this one hooked me right from the off. I think it opens with, um, a beautiful sequence it's almost like it's almost like uh, being read a poem the opening of this game where they describe this 
girl who left her hometown behind and the horrors of that hometown and then went out into this this desolate apocalyptic world just trying to escape um, and then is drawn back by the death of her mother and I think the music and the pixel art and just the the, the, the timbre of the of the words that were chosen there I just thought this is going to be something special it kind of hooked me right from the off um, yeah. and I think the, the thing that really got me with this one as I was moving through it was I love it when a game crashes together lots of different topics lots of different subjects lots of different scenes kinds of thinking um, and somehow manages to weave together something that feels both sprawling and inviting at the same time um, it reminds me of something like Kentucky mm. Route Zero which manages to do that with you know theatre design with uh, live music with uh, poetry yeah. as you're picking the lines that your character says um, with weighty concepts um, and ideas about art and you know, in-game exhibitions and all of that stuff, and it's just such a rich world, and it makes it one of my favourite games of all time. And, and Norco, I, de- I think, is definitely treading on that same ground as Kentucky Route Zero, right? Mm, I would totally agree with you there. I think Kentucky Route Zero and Disco Elysium were the two that um, were sort of my my watchwords for for this. You know, they're all talking in sort of um, they're talking about um, how. I guess how ideology and capitalism and, and power affects a place. Um, you know, they're weirdly enough in a direct comparison to Kentucky Route Zero. There's also a power company causing a lot of the, the woes in this um, mm-hmm. in this world in Norco. Um, but as you said, like the writing is so beautiful and it brings in so many different themes from you know poverty to technology to history to religion. Um, there's just a ton, uh, and it's also specific that it could really only be told by a person who is from a place and knows its history and knows how those various forces interact um, mm-hmm. in in that one specific place. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I was um, th- kind of <clears throat> strangely thrilled to find out. Like, I did not know that Norco was a real place. And so when I started playing this game, I didn't know that. Um, and so, you know, yeah. when it Norco turns out to be an acronym for the, what was it, New Orleans Refining Company, um, which was right. a real company. Um, and buildings came up around the industry, and that suddenly became known as a region called Norco. Um, and this is a real place; mm-hmm. it absolutely blew my mind. Um, and then the fact that it's been built into this—I mean, the range of subjects is nuts. You know, there's this the mall that's been taken over by a, a strange yeah. <laughs> bro gang. There is like a, the actual industry that goes on around Norco, like the the, the ditch digging and the water pollution. Um, the, There's a bunch of people having a party in the swamp trying to launch a rocket. <laughs> right. It's absolutely wild. And it, it brings to mind this, you know, looking at the U.S. from overseas, when we see things like um, the Trump guys storming the Capitol and all of the um, the QAnon stuff, oh, yeah. there, there is this like <laughs> f- crazy fringe there, you know, um, and it's like a, a fever dream almost on the edge of society. And this game seems to take you into the heart of that, I think. It, it really does. And I think it's sort of, um, it's a really interesting how it's, you know, it does play with all of these sort of, you know, modern alt-right themes and, and how they sort of metastasize into some of the craziest things you can see in society. And, and also just sort of plays with the idea of like, this is a game that's sort of all about not just the, the ramifications of these entities that are in power, you know, the Norco, the New Orleans Refining Company, or in real life, it's Shell. Um, but it's also um, about climate change, right? Because New Orleans is directly in the path of the impending climate catastrophe, you know, basically being below sea level. Um, it is um, going to, you know, it's going to have uh, an interesting future in the, in the coming years. And to your point, you know, some of these elements and sort of the weird fringe that comes out of this comes out of sort of that feeling of like futurelessness that mm-hmm. people may feel, you know, being in these places that are sort of dealt a, a hard hand and don't really have any any help coming to them that's readily visible, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of there's a lot of searching for meaning going on in Norco, isn't there? There's diff- people trying mm-hmm. different kind of coping mechanisms and looking to religion, looking to technology, looking to combination of the two. Um, and the, the gig economy looking to outer like space that, <laughs> looking to outer space looking to get the hell off the planet altogether yeah and you get this this interesting <laughs> app where an AI gives you jobs that you don't understand and there are you know hundreds of people just carrying out this these strange jobs that don't appear to be jobs it's it's very confusing it's very yeah, the most uh, intoxicating kind of 
yeah, in the most 2020s move of, of all time, you are uh, literally using a um, gig app to uh, get cryptocurrency uh, from an AI. <laughs> it is it is very much plucked from the headlines in, in that regards and, and how it's handling technology and, you know, what it's used for and uh, how at the, the end of the day, some of it's just a scam. And uh, mm-hmm. that is, uh, it's it's very affecting and poignant and rings true, especially with, uh, you know, recent news. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think something that struck me as well is the format of it, because, you know, um, Kentucky Route Zero is in chapters, of course, famously, and was made in chapters. And something about that structure seems to suit it. It's almost like reading a book. And the way that Norco works mm. is that, you know, there are <clears throat> alternate chapters. So you'll have a couple of different characters that you're going to be meeting throughout that journey. Um, and it feels like you read one chapter from one and one chapter from another. So it alternates back and forth. Um, and it really did feel like like reading a good book, in, but but in a way that only a, a video game could deliver with all of that, that, you know, the sound, the music, the visuals that you're getting, the interactivity and decision-making. So, yeah, it felt it felt like a really good book to me in that way. I totally agree with you there. I, I almost I almost forgot about the the varied perspective there, and and really interesting how uh, you're playing these two characters part of the same family and sort of in different moments in time um, and with different histories, but of course a lot of shared history as well. Um, it's yeah, it's it's one of a kind, you know. I and I know we've made a lot of allusions to. Kentucky Route Zero or Disco Elysium or, you know, I think Citizen Sleeper can stand in this this camp as well, honestly, as mm-hmm. sort of these pillars of narrative game design. And um, but I, I think it's it's truly its own thing. You know, each of those four games that I just mentioned are so different from each other. And yet all of them are using what they're doing in service of telling a really amazing story and, and getting across points about these, you know, heavy, hard hitting topics at hand. Right, so your top two of the year, two games left, two yeah. big ones. Um, yeah, they, they are the games that have been going head to head in uh, the, the zeitgeist and in the, the broader game of conversation, I guess. So, so how did you um, how did you get on with these two at the top here? Yeah, so I uh, we have we have two games left. Uh, you know, God of War, Ragnarok, and, and Elden Ring. I would say my my top my top one is for sure Elden Ring, but. Um, uh, the other four that we talked about, you know, Stray, Pokemon, Norco, and God of War, I think are all, they're vying for the various positions in that top five. But let's talk about God of War first, yeah? I um, I, I, I don't know if necessarily this is, is going to end up being my, my final number two, because while I really enjoyed my time with it, I still, you know, I think it was one of those sequels where it is more of the same. And I love the same, right? Like, God of War Ragnarok is... Um, very much like a bigger, um, longer uh, God of War 2018. And I think it does a lot of things really well. And uh, some things just didn't hit as hard. And I don't, I, I think some of the reason for that is because the writing and some of it is because, you know, I've seen it before, right? Like there wasn't a ton new aside from the obvious fantastic environments and events and things like that happening. Um, I understand you played this as well, uh, John. What were your thoughts on Ragnarok? Right. I mean, um, I, I played 2018, it's a little bit like Horizon, I played 2018 in anticipation of Ragnarok coming, um, and, and loved it actually, I loved the, the solemnness of it, yeah. um, and I loved the <clears throat> mm-hmm. the read, I, lo- I loved that they crashed together this wonderful character of Kratos into the Norse pantheon, because I have an interest in the North Pan- Norse pantheon anyway, and I was a big fan of that mm-hmm. game, it felt somehow like quite weighty, and in a way that I appreciated, yeah. I liked the sadness of it. Um, and Ragnarok to me, I mean, they clearly, they changed director, of course. Um, and I think they changed direction as well. Mm. This game is much more colorful, uh, much more yeah. um, MCU than that very focused, yeah. sad, uh, sad dad tale that Last of Us influenced um, 2018 game. And whilst you're right, it, it's an absolute continuation of it. I was taken aback, more so than the Horizon games, I think, by just how just how much it felt like 
really shiny DLC almost in terms of the mechanical similarity. You know, um, like yeah. the three the three rune chests are still there. The back of Kratos looks just the same as the back of Kratos looked last time, <laughs> um, and it really did. Yeah, pick I mean, up the story I'm not gonna. I'm not, uh, I totally agree with you, and I'm not going to like harp on them for you know keeping the same incredible beautiful assets uh, from from the last game. But I think Mm -hmm. you you hit on something that maybe rubbed me the wrong way about this. And, you know, I I guess I'm probably going to sound more negative than uh, I need to be. I loved God of War Ragnarok, but the Mm -hmm. MCUification thing that you mentioned is uh, very apparent to me. Like the seriousness and emotional heft that God of War 2018 brought, you know, it opened with a funeral and sort of ended with the conclusion of that funeral. (laughs) And um, Mm -hmm. the uh, the uh, this one in uh, <clears throat> excuse me the the difference between that and Ragnarok is you're absolutely right it just felt like sort of this big um you know Avengers movie sort of you know you have all of your various members of the Norse pantheon and they've all got to come together to stop the big bad guy and uh some of the like tonal whiplash that I got and <laughs> some of the sort of quips that the characters would spout out at a moment it's sort of you know how uh, everyone had that moment where they made fun of that upcoming game, Forspoken, for having like a "well that happened" uh, type mm-hmm. dialogue. Mm-hmm. I just felt like that was happening a lot in Ragnarok. You know, uh, just kill the Hydra. Well, that just happened, and I, right. it just didn't work. You know, Kratos saying "well that just happened." It, it didn't happen in this game, of course, but there were just moments that the way the game was treating itself just seemed a little too twee and sarcastic for my taste. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, mean, I think that pe- this game has been very, very highly rated, and it's sitting here right at the top of your list here. So you've clearly enjoyed it as well. Um, and yeah, the, I think the thing that I liked about God of War 2018 maybe was the thing that was lost in Ragnarok. And I think people that were really, really into that combat, and maybe people that pushed up the difficulty and got really into the, you know, the, the gameplay and the nuts yeah. and bolts of it all. Um, we're just so happy to have more God of War and bigger God of War and shinier God of War. <laughs> but I think for me, I just I played through it. Um, I, I in this game, I I didn't really get into the combat. I ended up cranking the difficulty down. I was in it for the story, and so the fact that the story um, is so entirely different in tone perhaps lost the things that I really liked yeah. about 2018. But it seems that for a lot of people, they were really happy with what they got, even with the changes. And some people prefer it even so. So I do get the two sides on on Ragnarok for sure. Yeah, I, I do too. You know, I'm, I, as you said, you know, I'm, I'm clearly high on this game. Like I had a great time playing it. I did think it stuck around just a little too long. It's probably double the length of the last one. Um, mm-hmm. And if you're including side content, maybe even more than that. Um, but it's, it, it just had um, this sort of, like, I think it opened extremely strong and it closed pretty strong too. But there is this middle, the middle of God of War Ragnarok, where there were sort of these moments of cascading failures and one MacGuffin leading you to another MacGuffin. Mm-hmm. You know, well, you cleared out the basement, but uh, you're not going to like what you find in the attic um, mm-hmm. sort of situation. And um, I I don't know. I, I you know, the, the cascading failures thing I think can work. Like I just played Dead Space, you know, a 2008 game um, or t- 2011 game um, earlier this year. Um, and that had sort of a continuing cascading failures thing. But I think it just it can work in a situation where it keeps the runtime short and it's all to a purpose. But a lot of the time I feel like God of War Ragnarok maybe uh, lost the plot on itself a little bit, you know, one MacGuffin leading to another to wait, why am I in this realm again? And by the time you leave it, it's entirely different than when you started there. Um, But at the end of the day, like the moment to moment, the combat especially remains really strong and fun. Some of the best out there. And it looks Mm -hmm. great. Like you've said, and these characters are wonderful. Like I think, um, how they continue to flesh out Artreus and Kratos and their relationship with the various people in the world. It's all really interesting and good. Um, it's just some moments where they stepped in it a little bit, I guess. Yeah, yeah, that rings true to me. It's, it's certainly, I think, if in terms of big, shiny AAA Sony games that have crunching combat and, and wild environments and sort of seat of the pants yeah. set pieces <clears throat> and all of that stuff, it, it definitely does a great job of it. It was a big, impressive, um, super shiny, cutting edge video game for sure. Yeah, I, I agree with you. You know, um, I, I think maybe uh, when when a game is as polished uh, to like a mirror sheen as something like Ragnarok, it's 
it's only natural to like fixate on the the tiny incremental flaws that you can find there. Um, and you know, I, I want to continue to say, I don't want to miss the, the forest for the trees here. This is a very strong game. I, you know, obviously it, it, one of my, my favorite experiences of the year, but, um, I, I guess maybe in the quest to continue to appeal to an ever broader set of God of War fans, it maybe lost some of what, um, made it special in that 2018 outing, at least from, from my perspective. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, they took away a lot of the melancholy and they put in some really cool stuff in its place. <laughs> and if uh, if you like that cool stuff, yeah. then you know, <laughs> they did a great job. So. <laughs> yeah. But the, nope, the, I'm, I'm I'm with you on that one. Um there's there's plenty here for the God of War fan who is seeking um a a romp through the North uh Norse pantheon and uh, a beautiful colorful world full of lots of content, I guess. Mhm. Yeah, and I will say that the, some of the new stuff they added in was really nice. They they did speed up the traversal with that little hook shot that you get, um, mm. so you have less uh, slow yeah. climbing animations. That was a touch that I really appreciated. Uh, really enjoyed the uh, the dog sled that you get as a new vehicle that just yeah. allows you to just go hissing across the snow. Um, and there were some lovely moments, like if you're going across deep, powdery snow on the sled, and then you move on to ice, like the way that they did that with the uh, the Dual Sense controller. You really did feel the change, mm-hmm. and uh, the sound was different. Like, there was a lot to like here, and it was very impressive. And as you say, um, they maybe had to um, do a little bit of jumping through narrative hoops to make it happen, but it's not all set in the frozen Norse wastes this time. As you do hop through the um, the different zones, they, they look much more punchy and varied than in, in the first game, right? Yeah, yeah, they it strikes me that they may have had a bulleted list of cool moments and places to go and things to do. Mm-hmm. And they tried their best to, uh, you know, form the connective tissue to make all of those things happen in this game and by and largely succeeded, but but mm-hmm. where where that scaffolding shows is um is where where maybe I'm bumping into some of my uh reservations. <laughs> mm-hmm. Right, so you've said that like uh, your number one game is like a very clear, cut and dry, um, head and shoulders above the rest, right? Oh yeah, and and <laughs> that would be Elden Ring. Uh, Elden Ring is by far my favorite game of the year. Um, I think uh, you know I, I I mentioned this uh, in our our little poll and in your Discord uh, for gaming in the wild. Um, but you know I was it was sort of tailor made for me. Like there was almost no way that if this game came out well, that me a um, huge fan of Breath of the Wild and a gigantic uh, FromSoft and Souls game fan would not love this game. And, and sure enough, they made the game that uh, I've kind of wanted ever since I played Breath of the Wild. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, it is it is truly like, uh, it's definitely my favorite game of 2022. Probably my favorite uh, game of the last few years. It, it may in fact be my favorite game of all time as of, as of this recording. Um, I, I can't say enough good things about it, um, but I think uh, what I will maybe say is that it deviates from the Souls formula in terms of allowing such a wide variety of two approaches to a given problem, and even allowing you to just say, "No, I'm not dealing with this right now," and, and go do something entirely different. That stands um, sort of in the face of how the the series has been to date, and I think it's a, a change up in the best way for for what this studio can do going forward. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, it's interesting to hear from a Souls uh, veteran on this one, because as you say, um, the open world is a completely new um, spin on their whole genre, right? And this is actually the first FromSoft game that I ever picked up. Um, I, um, I've said many times on the podcast that I'm a sucker for hype, and the hype around Elden Ring was kind of unprecedented, I think, the, the amount of anticipation <laughs> around it. And so even as someone that is vaguely terrified of, of From games and of, and who shies away a little bit from... Um, super hard games basically you know um having powered through a couple things mm-hmm. like hollow knight etc but just the the intentional difficulty and brutality of those games never appealed to me but when there was so much right. anticipation around this game i just had to play it and yeah um, i think i ended up playing 70 hours of it um wow for, for me i didn't um, realize you played so much that's great <laughs> yeah i, I um but I, I will say that i i took a quite a slow route through it um at first i was just you know that first um, gate side camp that you get to um, right yeah, at the start yeah, of the of game? Course. Right at the <laughs> base of Stormvale. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. I spent an inordinate amount of time 
creeping around that camp. I thought, I'm going to use this as my opportunity to learn how to play Dark Souls <laughs> games. I'm going to learn how to creep around. I'm going to learn how to backstab. And until I can clear this camp, I'm not moving on. <laughs> and I must have spent like <laughs> count, countless lives and countless hours and, until I had finally cleared that camp and taken out that that gold guy, leveled up a bunch of times. Yeah. <laughs> and it was just a, a kind of hilarious, slow creep into the Souls world. But after that, did feel somewhat empowered and ended up managing to take mm-hmm. down, you know, Margit and uh, Godric and the guy on the, yeah. uh, the giant guy on the little horse. And did a lot of it myself, actually. Oh, you like, got without... through Radan. Yeah, that was the first time that I used a summon in the game, was Radan. Um, wow. But Margit, I really carved that one out, and it must have been, you know, 40 tries to do it, learning how to block, learning the patterns, falling off the edge hilariously, just getting crushed and crushed and crushed. <laughs> and I will say that even as a, you know, a, a first-time FromSoft player who is um, out of their element, I did feel that that tingle that people talk about <laughs> when you take down that, you finally take down that big horrific boss that has just been punishing you for hours, like actually taking down Margit. Re- I did, really did get a little taste of that euphoria that people talk about here. Oh, yeah. No, it, it's a real thing. And, it, you know, the interesting thing that I think Elden Ring does um, is while that moment is there and it's just as potent as it's ever been with regards to the series, you know, finally overcoming that big challenge is what I really liked that Elden Ring changed was the addition of that open world allowed you to basically say, run into that wall that is Margit and say, you know what? Um, I'm going to use this as an opportunity to be propelled away back from that brick wall of Margit into the entire Southern continent. You can go down to the weeping peninsula and literally spend like 15 hours just clearing that place out. And then the next time you go and see Margit, you don't just win that battle that you were previously getting stomped on. You humiliate Margit. <laughs> you know, you can you can jump the uh, the power curve in, in this game in a really nice way. Um, and it's one of those things where how the game's direct predecessor from the studio, Sekiro, was extremely prescriptive about, you know, we want you to play this way. We want we know exactly the power that you are going to have going into this boss battle. And we have this very tight scripted, you know, jewel or diamond of a, an experience we want you to have. Elden Ring just sort of litters the whole landscape with those diamonds and says, go pick up as many as you want, put them in your pocket, and then go fight this boss when you're feeling good and rich and ready. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think I respond much better to that. You know, I am not a huge fan of like the balls hard difficulty stuff as well, even though, um, you know, I I consider myself a pretty big fan of these types of games. Um, And, you know, at the same time, I'm also not huge into grinding. So all of those things sort of run into each other in a, in a way that sort of makes me have an adversarial relationship with some of the FromSoft games. But Elden Ring just removed that by saying, you know what, go do what you want. And then when you're ready, come back and, and this experience is waiting for you. And there's mm-hmm. always just so much in this world that that Elden Ring created that I never found it hard to find something to, to get me to where I needed to be for a given challenge. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's true. It's a wonderful world that they've created here. It's it's a real vision, you know. It's like the the gothic yeah. horror of it all and the high fantasy of it all and the the design of the environment like those those mountains that you can see from far away that are just jutting out of the sea, the glittering sea and those strange spiraling towers and just the vast tree that hangs over it all like this golden ghost. It's just it's very compelling and and yeah, I really felt that I felt the dark horror and fascination. Like I need to go move deeper into this world. I need to know more and and to just keep witnessing yeah, it. I, I must know more. Mm-hmm. That is exactly how I feel. And I'd be remiss to say that the reason that these games initially sort of hooked me is because of all of the sort of ambient environmental storytelling. And, and Elden Ring has that in spades, just like all of its predecessors. But um, further enhanced by the inclusion of famed author George R. R. Martin, who <laughs> apparently wrote the, some of the backstory. Um, you know, I, I see his influence here in sort of like the, the backstory politics of the pantheon of gods that are on display here. Um, but I, I did find it interesting that they sort of relegated Martin's, um, contributions to the backstory so that if he pulled a winds of winter, um, and took five years to create whatever it is they needed out of him, um, they could still make the game. <laughs> right. It's a good point, actually. Yeah. It's more like law that he wrote, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, that that was my understanding of how it worked. And, you know, I think that all sort of came in and contributed to this really rich tapestry of a world that um, you were just talking about here and, and sort of 
untangling like, why is this person here? What are they trying to accomplish? Why am I, you know, what is being put in motion with my, say, defeat of Radon and, you know, it unsticks the stars and you, you know, have these world changing events that you're sort of setting off. Just a lot of really interesting backstory and lore and, and you know, it, it rewards a deep read. And as you clearly uh, did it, it rewards sort of a long play, you know, just sort of immersing yourself in it and seeking out the strange and crazy things you'll find around every hidden mm-hmm. nook and cranny of the, the gigantic world they have here. Right. Yeah, I didn't actually finish this one. Um, I think, uh, where did I leave it? I had just gotten, I just completed Nokron. The uh, the beautiful underground city with yeah. that, that surreal starscape and some truly horrific enemies to fight down there. And I think I had just gotten up to, I just arrived at the capital, um, and then I mm. I was sort of neck deep in in Elden Ring at this point and really feeling it. And then like you know the way that yeah. life sometimes just takes over. I went away on a, a sunny holiday for a couple of weeks, and when I got back, I picked up the controller and <laughs> I felt like tired. I felt tired. I picked up the controller and I thought, okay, time for some Elden Ring. <laughs> and this feeling of weariness just crept into me. And I actually never went back yep. to it since then. But, you know, 70 hours of game is not bad. And I've got a feeling that in my future, there is a second wind when it comes to Elden Ring, you know? Yeah, I will say that I think it is, it rewards, it rewards not just a, a, a coming back to in a, a replay, or but more so a replaying than, than any of the others before it. Um, uh, actually, we have a I'm um, we have a pending podcast coming out on Elden Ring, and and Josh and I both, as we prepared to talk about that game, started new characters, and um, we compared notes on that experience from the first time to the second. And the wild thing is, we uh, we both managed to make it through Margit within an hour of playing, mm-hmm. which you know, <laughs> given the first time through, that was like at least a dozen hours. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. It was quite a, a shift, you know, and it, it holds true to like what has always drawn me to these games is like the experience you gain the sort of muscle memory and then also just sort of the knowing the systems and what's it's what's at play just compresses you know experience compresses time and space and just sort of in in the best way it rewards sort of that um that deep read Mm -hmm. absolutely yeah so yeah it feels like i'm hopeful that you uh, experience the same (laughs) Right, and it does feel like this game just goes deep. There's so much to find there. It's the kind of game that you really can get lost in. Um, I think for me, the the difficulty of it and the hostility of it is definitely a mood, and it takes it takes a little bit of um, limbering up to engage with, if you know what I mean. So as the year rounds oh, out, yeah, I've been totally much more in the uh, in the relaxing strays and uh, the sensitive citizen sleepers of this world. But you know, I'm going to come back to Elden Ring. I'm determined to do it at some point, and. It was nice to hear you talk about it, and I will look forward to that episode as well. Yeah, well, thank you. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm really glad to, I'm, I'm always happy to come on and, and talk about my my favorite games. And, uh, you know, I, 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 I'm always happy to talk about Elden Ring. There's just so many great and interesting things in, in that game. You know, we didn't even talk about how different it is with regards to mobility. You know, you get the world's greatest horse torrent, mm-hmm. things like that. It's just, you know, there's a lot there. And uh probably more than we have time to discuss, but um, thank you for my for indulging me on what is clearly my favorite game of the year, Elden Ring. <laughs> yeah, wonderful to hear you talk about it. Um, and I think that we will wind it up there. So thank you very much for coming on, Brian. It's an absolute pleasure to talk to you. Um, yeah, it was lovely to hear you talking about Elden Ring, honestly. Um, it's such an interesting, deep game, and people take such different things from it. It was it was really fun to talk through your your games of the year. So thank you for coming on. Well, thank you, John. I, you know, as I said, I'm a big fan of your podcast and, and you have a wonderful community going uh, there with uh, Gaming in the Wild. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm always on that Discord and there's a lot of great people, yourself included, to, to chat. So thank you for having me on and, and thanks for uh, the great podcast, too. And where can people come and find Pixelated Playgrounds? I, I think that listeners of Gaming in the Wild will for sure enjoy the uh, the, the type of look that you guys take and the, the tone that you bring to the podcast it's a, a lovely lesson um, and so where should people come to find pixelated playgrounds yeah we're on we're on all of your um uh, sundry podcast services your itunes spotify etc pixelated playgrounds um, also pixelated playgrounds.com is our website uh, we are at pixel play pod on twitter and uh, i'm at brian skersha i don't really tweet except for about the podcast but um 
yeah, you can uh, find me at those locations. And uh, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's a lot of fun. We love making the pod and more people listen. That's always great. Yeah, recommend that you check it out, everybody. And thanks very much, Brian. Have a great Christmas. You too, John. So, everybody, I hope that you enjoyed that Games of the Year conversation with Brian Skersher from Pixelated Playgrounds. I really enjoyed that one. We have a lot of shared ground. It was fun to talk to a Pokemon veteran about my Pokemon newbie experience and to hear about all of Brian's Games of the Year. Um, I'll be hopefully doing some more Games of the Year episodes across the coming weeks. Um, In the meantime, you're welcome to come and talk games with me on social media. You can find Gaming in the Wild on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook and YouTube and Twitch, all as Gaming in the Wild. Um, You can also become a patron of this show if you would like to support the show. I'm really happy to have had a couple new patrons over the last couple weeks. So thanks very much to Rachel and Lawal, who have both become brand new end of year patrons of the show and they will get access to nine bonus episodes, including uh, one new one, which I will be doing this month also as well as access to the show's Discord to come and talk games with all of the other patrons. Um, The show's Discord is, of course, the friendliest corner of the internet to talk about games that you will ever find. A whole bunch of people just chatting about what they're playing, what they're playing over Christmas, what we're getting in the sales, and all of that sort of thing. So please do feel free to join them um, and become a supporter on Patreon. That's at patreon.com slash gaminginthewild. I'll be back next week with a new episode. And until then, have happy holidays for those who celebrate. Take care of yourselves and each other, and bye-bye for now.